All right, Tyler. Yeah. Tyler, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from Southern California, uh, more specifically the Inland Empire or the IE, which is out by San Bernardino, Riverside kind of area, which is uh, about the halfway point between uh, LA and Palm Springs out towards the desert. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your family growing up. Uh, my family was a pretty, pretty close family. I have an older brother and an older sister. I'm the youngest. I'm the baby of the family. Um, parents, uh, separated when I was probably about fifth grade, but still kind of, you know, both were around, both kind of trying to be, be, be a part of everything, but you know, not, not together. Sounds like a pretty good childhood. Yeah, decent, you know. No crazy abuse, anything like that? Uh, no, no abuse. Uh, didn't, didn't have a lot of money growing up, but uh, my parents, you know, they always kind of tried to do the best they could for us. But yeah, good. You, you made it through high school? Yeah. You go any, anything beyond that? Uh, ab about a semester of college. Okay. And then, and then that stopped. And then years later, I actually ended up becoming, uh, an employee of that college that I oh. <laughs> only spent about a semester <laughs> at. And what kind of work have you done since you, uh, left home? Uh, of course I started in fast food, you know, which most, most kids do high school age, uh, fast food. And then, um, went to a little bit of retail, um, selling you know, CDs and VHS, DVDs, that type of stuff. And then uh, from there, I actually went on to be a counselor at a boys' home. Uh, f uh, it was a facility. Uh, I think there was eight or nine dorms. There was probably about 80, 80 kids there, wards of the state or juvenile hall kids that, you know, getting a chance to rehabilitate you know and so I worked there and then I went to a boys home which was a six bed boys home and then uh after that I became a bartender so I kind of all over the place mm -hmm. and then eventually you started working at uh, strip clubs I did actually uh my first bartending job was um at uh, a place called the Moose Lodge and then after that, I got a job at a strip club as a bartender, which was fun, but didn't really work out because this isn't what people go in to see at a strip club. So when you go to the bar, it, it, you know, the, the tips were never too good on my side. It was always the female bartenders that got more. So I ended up becoming a DJ, which was a much better fit for me. Your, your, your look scared people. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, what, what, I guess. Tell, tell me about all your piercings and your your tattoos and all that. Um, growing up, I always wanted to get tattoos. Uh, being a fan of music and musicians, I was never really into like comic book characters or superheroes. My superheroes were Freddie Mercury, the Axl Rose, the the, the rock stars, you know. So, growing up in the, in the eighties. Motley Crue, like that was when kind of tattoos. So I always wanted tattoos. So as soon as I turned 18, uh, I got my first tattoo and then it was done from there. Yeah, but yours are a little bit beyond just the typical tattoos. Yeah, you, you got I, things I, under your skin. I, I started with the tattoos and then and then the piercings. And then once I had kind of done all of that, I wanted to see how much further I could go. And uh, I discovered uh, hook suspension or flesh, flesh suspension where you take hooks and you raise the a person up off the ground. And so you're, uh, you're raising yourself off the ground with piercings, which with, are attached where on your body? Um, the, the first place is the back. That's where you start. But I've done it uh, in the past 15 years. I've done it from the back, the chest, the ribs, uh, above the knees, below the knees, the forearms. So th there's many places that you can you can use for a suspension. What's, what's the attraction to that? Originally, the attraction for me was just to see if I could do it mentally and physically. And uh, then once I did do it, it's just it's a whole lot of fun. You know, you, you get a, Is that um, a whole lot of pain too. It, it's a, it's some pain. Uh, everybody's kind of different. Some people don't like the hooking. Some people don't like the hanging. So uh, you're, you're hanging by how many hooks? 
Typically, um, well, it depends on where you do in different positions. So if you're laying chest down or stomach down, then you could have 10 hooks in your back and your legs. Uh, the and first time I did it was four in my back, but now I typically do it with two. And how, or, long, how long will you, will you do this? Uh, we do... We do private ones and we do public like shows. So that depends. I've, I've hung for about an hour and a half before uh, and then 45 minutes, half hour. So there, there's many different time lengths, so whether you're shows. doing a, a performance or just a personal one. Is there something that you enjoy the shock value of, of what you do or what you look like? I think that's kind of what led me to to become what I've become is I do enjoy shock value. Because you have, you have bumps under your arms and hands. Yeah, that, that came after the suspension. Once I got into, I, I did the suspension and then that kind of, that opened up a whole new world for me. And I, I started making friends that had uh, implants and split tongues and all, all different kinds of uh, body mod which it's called your ears are stretched out my ears yeah they uh when i have a uh, jewelry in it a plug it's a two inch hole and then you have things in your forehead too yes i do uh currently uh i, I have flat plates on it but i can unscrew that screw in spikes and then uh, i have horns so that all it it started with suspension and then it all grew and then i discovered the the uh the implants and just kind of went crazy with it. But what for a what do you think while. it is at its core? Do you think it's a call for attention? Do you think it's just trying to shock the the normal? I I think it's folks? kind of it's it's a shock for me personally. I think it's also kind of like maybe an artistic side, you know, showing art on on the body. I, I enjoy that. Um, so it's like I, you're, you're, I don't want. I don't necessarily think it's a call for attention because I typically don't like attention which this has really not been a good idea in that case because it, it does draw attention to me. But I, I, I do like the shock of it. And you're, you're going to be misunderstood, which some people I, I know get off on. Yeah. Uh, mis yeah, but, you know, everybody, definitely people uh, still today judge a book by its cover, you know. So when you look like this, people expect you to be a certain way or you know, be, be a bad or a mean person, which I, I try to, when, when, uh, when I was growing up and I started with all of this, the tattoos and then the piercings and it started growing, uh, the one thing that, that I was told by, by my mom was, uh, you, you can look however you want, but just be a good person, treat people right. And that's what I always try to do. You know, people expect me to sometimes be, uh, not a good person, but that's why I try to, go beyond that and try to be, you know. I, I suspect it's almost like you're, you're testing people's notion or understand or beliefs about, you know, you know a book, reading a book by its cover. Yeah. Um, and by doing this, you're, but, but being a, the opposite type of person, you're, you're kind of trying to expose people's mistaken beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. I'm, I'm challenging people to to look beyond that. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So in the, in the club, you're you're now a DJ. Uh, yeah. So uh, so after bartending and then becoming a DJ, that's now that we're here. Uh, 18 years later, 18 years that I've been been DJing. What what, what have you learned about people from working, uh, at, working at a strip club for for 18 years? You know, there there's. There's all different types of people everywhere. Um, the people, I, I've met some of the best people that I've known in my life through the strip club, but I've also met some of the worst people. So you've got all types of people everywhere. And that's, that's the main thing I've learned. You know, everybody kind of like judging a book, you know, people will assume you're in this industry, so you're this type of person, or you, you do this and so, that you know you're, you're, you're pinholed to that but uh it's i mean i some of the dancers i've worked with are now lawyers you know i i've i've worked with some very intelligent people just you know it, it's it's a job it's an industry but all different types of people and i've i've worked with um 
in 18 years, I, I've worked with many different types of people as far as uh, physically too. I've worked with blind dancers. I've worked with uh, uh, amputee dancers. And one girl had one leg. Mm. Um, deaf, deaf dancers. So, you know, you, you can find all types of people in there. And it's really, you know, most of the places I've worked at, it's, it's a family. It's more so because I've worked in retail and I've worked in restaurants and I've worked in all different types of stuff. No job I've had is really kind of people look out for each other and take care of each other as they do in, in that industry from what I've found. And some of the women are doing it for, they're doing it for different purposes. Some, I mean, some they all do it for different purposes. They, you've, you've got the party girls, you've got the ones that just, you know, can't do a nine to five or, or don't want to. And then you've got, you've got the girls that legitimately are working their way through school. And like I said, some have become lawyers and uh, some might be doctors by now. I know lots of nurses and, you know, medical assistants have gone through there, but they've, they, you know, some of them actually are, are working to either support their family or, or better their life and, and go beyond that, mm -hmm. you know? But then there are the ones that kind of get, get trapped in there. It is, it, it, it's, it's a fine line in that industry. You know, you, you could go one way or you can go the other. Yeah. Which uh, luckily for me, I, I was far on one side of the line and luckily I was able to jump to the other side. Tell me, and, about, tell me about the men that come into strip clubs. Are, are most of them fooled by how, how friendly the girls are? Uh, yes. <laughs> so the first thing everybody tells me she really is, likes me. you've got the greatest job ever. Oh, that too. And of course it's, you know, I'm not digging ditches and I'm not sitting in a cubicle, but I don't get the side that the customer gets. You know, the, the customer comes in, sits down and she gets that sweet, pretty girl that sits and rubs his shoulder and asks if he had a hard day. And then I'm, I'm necessarily the psychiatrist for the girl. She comes and I hear the problems and I, I get the attitude and I get, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a different side of it. So the guys don't see that. So, um, so, so they're definitely like, that's the, the only side they see of it is that nice, friendly, pretty side. Uh, but then also the, some of the guys that come in are kind of jerks too, you know, like some of the stuff that I've overheard guys saying is pretty, pretty crazy. You know, they feel the dancer is an object and they can treat her however they want, or the girl down the street just turned him down. So now he's going to come and he's going to make her feel how he, you know, so, but the girls are friendly. So um but they but the, it's all about money for the girls yeah it is entirely I, I heard a comedian um i'm i'm not much for telling jokes so i'm sure i'm gonna destroy it but i heard a comedian a long time ago say that being in a strip club is the best way to judge how drunk you are because by the time you've had that final drink and you start thinking i think she really likes me she doesn't want my money she 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 just wants to have a conversation with me that's the point when you know it's time to go and you've had too much. Right. Um, being in the industry, that, that joke's always stuck with me because it, it, it's funny because it is true. Like I, I see that moment in the guys where they kind of switch and they're like, I think she really just, she just wants to spend time with me, you know? But it, it's a job, um, definitely. So yeah, they're, they're, but then there are the girls that are there just for, the party or the good times and kind of don't care about yeah. how much money they make. So like I said, there, there's all different types of girls in it. Are drugs a part of the uh, strip club scene? Drugs very much, uh, unfortunately, are a big part of the, the strip club scene. Um, you got the late hours, so that always, you know, and then being in a club atmosphere, it's always kind of around that. And then, of course, uh, just kind of dealing with the asshole guys, you know, that kind of helps, you know, couple drinks or whatever is going to kind of help you get through the night. So it, it is, I've seen a lot of people, uh, myself included, throughout their time in the strip clubs, 
become sober. Uh, I started in 2003 was when I started working in strip clubs and late in 2008, uh, I myself, I got sober. So you were using what? Um, drinking a lot. I worked in an alcohol club uh, in, in California. Um, topless clubs have full bar and then full nude clubs don't have alcohol. So where I always worked was topless with a uh, full bar. So drinking all the time and then um, smoking, smoking weed, of course. Uh, and then, you know, with with the late hours, you know, there's there's a lot of other stuff that's floating around. A lot of pills. Uh, Coke is really popular. Uh, luckily, luckily, meth was not really big in in the club that I was at in the area I was at. But I've been to other clubs where it has and that that runs rampant through clubs. But um, what made you get clean? Mostly it was just kind of it, it was the drinking initially drive driving home and just it, it all it all just started piling on and adding up. I was um spent a couple couple of times in the ER and uh I actually had a doctor kind of take me aside and say give yourself 6 months. Step away. Let your body kind of recover and give yourself six months and then reevaluate things and then go from there. And then that six months has just now become four, 16 years, eight. I'm not good on math, but a long you. time. That's great. Uh, I think 14 years, but it just, through those six months, I just started noticing so many changes. Uh, I, I, I had more money. I, mm -hmm was alert i was remembering things i i was in a better mood and i actually got promoted at my job i was paying more attention to what i was doing so just everything just started just i noticed everything around me improving and so i just kind of stuck with it your life worked out better very much so my my life has completely turned around and none of that would have happened if i didn't get sober back then and it all just came from six months and I continued working in the club for another 10 years after that, which is a whole other challenge, you know, to getting sober is, uh, is, is the first part, but then remaining sober is, is the, the definitely the more difficult part when you're still, you know, a lot of people, you just don't go to the bar and that, help, you know, but when your job is the bar, it, it's it's pretty difficult, so it takes quite quite a lot of willpower, but definitely worth it. Yeah. Do you have kids? No kids. No kids. No kids. Do you have any regrets in your life? I have lots of regrets. Um, kind of the the typical answer from what I've realized now through through in in I I don't want to say the later part of my life, but I, in the middle part of my life here, I've figured out. The only regrets you have are the things you don't do, which is, you know, typically what people say, you know, it's, that's kind of like the deathbed thing people say. That's the only thing I regret. And it's, it's really true. I, there's things that I've done that I wish I had done differently or I wish I hadn't done, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a regret because some of the worst moments of my life have led me to some of the greatest moments and greatest changes of my life. So, so e even, even the bad times, I wouldn't have any regrets. And that's why now in my life, I just try to do everything I can take every opportunity. And, and in the past couple of years, that's what I've done. And it's really taken me, I, I was starting to feel kind of 18 years in the strip club. I was feeling really kind of stuck in it. And then in the past two years, I've started working on a live streaming internet show. Uh, I've joined a few different bands, one of which I was a, a fan of myself when I was growing up back in junior high Which age. is? Uh... Uh, that's a band called Green Jelly. Uh, back in the 90s, they had a song called Three Little Pigs that was a pretty big song in the MTV days. 
Uh, I, I've been able to become very good friends with the, the singer of that band. And uh, I joined the band and now him and I and a group of our friends, we put on a weekly kind of a weekly variety show. It's like a punk rock hee haw kind of. But um, it's it's just it's a whole bunch of creative people coming together and probably three quarters of us are all sober. So it's it's a would, really would, would that be happening for you if you had not gotten sober? I, it, I don't it wouldn't because being sober and the way my life has gone since that has led me to where I am now. Mm -hmm. And had I not done that, I'd still be out in my small little desert town working at the same club that I worked at for 12 years, getting drunk, getting drunk, waking up at some time in the afternoon and then doing it all over again, stuck in that circle, yeah. you know? And then, um, luckily I found my way out and my, and my way out was getting sober. Essentially. What do you, what are you afraid of now at this point in your life? Snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I am afraid of snakes and I'm afraid of heights. Um, which is funny. Everybody always, whenever I say that, they always say, but you do suspension, you put hooks in yourself. It's a well, little, it's, it's completely not the same thing. Like right. one's the thing that'll bite me and the other. And, um, yeah, but what do you, what do you worry about? What do I, I worry about? Um, what are you afraid of? I, you know, I, I, Honestly, I don't think I, I don't really take much time to think about worries at this point. Um, I, I all, you know, I'm, I mean, I worry about my friends and my family and I want them all to be safe and I want them all to be happy. That's Other great. than that, I really, you know, what's more important than that. Yeah. There, there's nothing that that's the most important thing. And then as far like taking every opportunity I can, you can't let fear get in the way of that, you know, because if you have any fear at all, you're not going to take a step or make a move, you know? So yeah, fear, I believe fear is one of the biggest problems we have. Definitely always. fear, uh, fear, fear leads to a lot of, you know, depression, depression. And then that leads to, you know, substance abuse and all that type of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, it does, it all comes back to fear. So yeah. I, I, I guess yeah, I can't really think of anything. I mean, years ago, of course, I, I had fears and I had concerns, but now with my with this new mindset of just going for everything, my, my my only fear is that I'm gonna miss out on something. Miss something right. that I'm I'm not gonna go for something. What, what would you say, Tyler, is the most uh, important lesson you've learned in your life? Um, the most important I've, lesson I've learned is just to just to be a good person and just to worry about yourself and just take care of your own life, you know, um, treat other people well. And if someone needs help then help them, but don't concern yourself with other people's world, you know, you've got your own world to create and how you want to. And yeah. Excellent. Tyler, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for having me. I'm glad that we got to sit down and have this talk. Yeah, I'm glad things are going well for us. Yes, great. Thanks.